I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get an Air Force One with me and fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow, I mean, excuse me, and it, well, even Moscow, probably. <laughs> and bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40% the cost you're paying now. Same company, same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's, it's still a very... On the two-year anniversary since the start of the war in Ukraine, President Vladimir Zelensky says 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed after Russia's invasion. According to BBC News, some experts estimate the number to be even higher. Also on the two-year anniversary of the war, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg expressed the organization's continued support for Ukraine and said the country was closer than ever to NATO. President Putin started this war because he wanted to close NATO's door and deny Ukraine the right to choose his own path. But he has achieved the exact opposite. Ukraine is now closer to NATO than ever before. We are helping to make your forces more and more interoperable with allies. We will open a new joint analysis training and education center in Poland together. And we are deepening our political ties through the NATO-Ukraine Council, where we consult and make decisions together. Ukraine will join NATO. It is not a question of if, but of when. This comes as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs Victoria Nuland seemed to admit the quiet part out loud when it comes to United States investment in Ukraine. By the way, we have to remember that the bulk of this money is going right back into the U.S. economy to make those weapons. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Nancy Mays said the White House has yet to define its mission in Ukraine and told Fox News yesterday that, quote, the one thing that you did not hear Jake Sullivan or Joe Biden say today or really ever is defining our mission in Ukraine. They have yet to define that mission. If we had the answer, we'd be talking about it and perhaps there'd be more support for it. But let's go to that Victoria Nuland um, statement, which I think shows you just how <laughs> wrong the whole approach is. The A few minutes later and he thinks he can wait out all of us. We need to prove him wrong. That was Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland last month discussing tactics to stop Russian President Vladimir Putin on the second anniversary of the Ukraine war. Now, just weeks later, the career diplomat turned top political appointee is retiring. Secretary of State Antony Blinken made the announcement Tuesday, March 5th. In a statement, Blinken said her efforts have been indispensable to confronting Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and helping Ukraine work toward the day when it will be able to stand strongly on its feet democratically economically and militarily. Newland has been serving as acting deputy secretary of state since last July. As Blinken acknowledged, she has been one of the most ardent proponents of U.S. support for Ukraine under the Biden administration. All right, back again, back in the saddle on the Hoplite Channel. President Biden doing the honors yet again with a memorable introduction. But this episode is not for him. Today we are here to say so long and thanks for all the cookies, former Undersecretary Victoria Newland. Yeah, um, I find it strange that I did a um, tribute um, episode for the late Gonzalo Lira um, like a month or so ago. And here we are um, witnessing the uh, ignominious departure, downfall, you might call, uh, of Victoria Newland and her early retirement from the State Department uh, in the midst of a massive war in Eastern Europe. So yeah, we're here to talk about um, uh, what's going on uh, on the ground in Ukraine. I haven't done a uh, Ukrainian war uh, update in a while. Um, it's not really uh, necessary, but I figured why not since um, Gonzalo called out Victoria Newland a year or more ago, two years ago. Uh, so, yeah, we're here to talk about that. But um, the big picture for Ukraine hasn't changed. Unfortunately, um, I, I called this about a year and a half ago that when the Biden administration started talking to Zelensky's government, 
saying, well, we kind of did this for you and we did that for you, but, you know, you know, maybe, you know, you might want to think about uh, stuff for yourself if this doesn't work out. As in, uh, we can't guarantee you that everything we promised you is going to happen. So you might want to start thinking about contingency plan. When that language was getting um, more and more frequent with the Ob Biden administration uh, in reference to Zelensky's government, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. They were, they were already hedging their bets that if this goes south on us, we need to jettison this guy in this war ASAP. But we'll keep pumping money into it as long as it's being circulated back, back to us uh, through back channels and um, <clears throat> FTX, <laughs> cryptocurrency uh, exchanges. Uh, yeah, as long as we're making money uh, on the money we send, uh, well, we'll keep this alive as long as we can. And from the intro, you saw uh, a, the previous clip uh, of Joe Biden giving his State of the Union for 2024. Uh Kicking it off, of course, with how important it is that the U.S. taxpayer be fleeced yet again to keep this uh, merry-go-round uh, running. And it's, it's just insane uh, for what's going on in my country, United States, with uh, the southern border completely overrun, uh, the Biden administration uh, being uh, caught red-handed and readily admitting that they have actually flown over 324,000 illegal immigrants into the United States uh, because, well, it's, it's not humane to ask them to illegally cross the border on foot. We're gonna make the US taxpayer fly them in, uh, but they'll fly on coach, so don't worry about that. We're, we're gonna fly them in, but it won't be business class and it certainly won't be first class. It'll be coach. But yeah, you the taxpayer, you're gonna pay for that too. Uh, all of that's going on. And yet this guy gets up there and the first thing he says in the State of the Union is how important it is that Congress pass money for uh, the Ukrainian war effort, which is a lost cause. Uh, it was a lost cause a year ago, and now it's just it's becoming sad and just pathetic that these people will get on the floor of Congress or the president will stand up at the State of the Union, and instead of talking about the State of the Union, he wants to talk about how this war and the billions of dollars we've just sent, good money going after bad, uh, needs, to, needs, to, needs to keep going. And it's, um, it's, it's beyond frustrating. But let's talk about um, the departure of Victoria Newland and how I think this is yet another canary in the coal mine, another sign that this war is going nowhere good for Ukraine and for the United States. And they are slowly just jettison, jettison the people and the uh, policies that brought us here. And when they walk away from it, uh, they'll look around and say, what are you talking about? That wasn't us, that wasn't, that wasn't our fault. But let's go back and do a um, quick synopsis of uh, what's going on between Russia and Ukraine in March of 2024. So we see the Russia-Ukraine war began uh, in the, uh, 2022, the end of February. 20, uh, 2022 to the present makes this war two years and a month old. So it's just over two years old. Uh, yeah, you could say like February 24th was when the official invasion occurred. But uh, the 22nd, uh, we kind of knew that you know, it was, it was a, a certainty. Uh, since uh, February 24th of 2022, the United States uh, has sent $74 billion to the country of Ukraine. And $46 billion of that 74 was for defense purposes. So the United States government, years ago, um, the excuse for not building the wall on the southern border was it was too much money. And it would be too uh, big of uh, a, a project to get done with current budget constraints. And I think President Trump at the time was requesting six billion, maybe five billion, on the on the cheap end. But you know, five six billion dollars to build a border wall to secure a southern border, which is now just completely non-existent. In two years, the United States has decided to shovel seventy four billion dollars 
for a foreign country to wage war against a world power like Russia. The EU, not to be outdone, uh, has shoveled over $93 billion uh, to the country of Ukraine to fight Russia. And the UK has sent $16 billion. So you have a combined $183 billion approximately between the US, EU, and UK for Ukraine to fight a war against Russia with, to this day, no identifiable goal or end game, right? It's just, we're going to give you money. We're going to give you billions. You're going to use our weapons and you're going to use our money and you're going to fight Russia and you're going to win. But they've never said like, well, let's say we do win. Then what? Do we, do we just conquer Russia? Do we like, do we occupy Russia? the largest country by landmass in the world. Um, and uh, don't they have nukes? Won't they use those nukes before we could even possibly do that? Or do we just keep this like proxy war going for the sake of, you know, waging war? They've never said there was, it's like Afghanistan and Iraq. Like what's the end game here? Are we going to colonize these countries? Are they going to set up their own governments? Then we're going to run it like a hegemony. We've never, we never said. We just said we're going there to beat the terrorists and we're going to fight for democracy. And, uh, well, it'll sort itself out. And it, it didn't, obviously. Um, let's look at the casualties. This, these are the hardest figures to find online. Like, you'd have a better chance at finding, like, a, a number of grains of sand in the world, on the world's beaches, than you'll get a agreed upon number for Russian and Ukrainian soldier casualties in this war. But I've looked at so many different sources. This is what I came up with. And again, this is sus. Uh, roughly 100,000 Russian casualties. That's killed or injured. No longer combat effective. Ukrainian casualties, 440,000. And I think that's being very generous. Um, and I'll say why in a moment, but it's one to four. Like, like the ratio, you know, knock off the last two. It's like for every soldier Russia loses, Ukraine's losing four. And I said in previous episodes, Russia has the ability to call up one million men if they need to. Ukraine doesn't have that ability anymore. So many men and women have fled Ukraine that the casualties... When they lose a man, they just can't call somebody fresh out of boot camp who's ready to go and fully trained. They are down to the like bottom of the barrel. They're, they're conscripting boys, young women, and, and old retired men to fight this war now. It is sick what's happening. That 440, I think, is way too low, and that 100 for Russia is generous. That There's 100,000 Russian casualties. But we've seen no subsequent territorial loss or gain uh, in the last year. Meaning, you know, Russia's taken land, Russia's given back land, Ukraine has won back land, but the Russians now, it's, it's clear, aren't fighting for territorial gain. This is a war of attrition, and that strategy is paying off for them. With one exception, there was a major battle last month in the town of Avdiivka, and the Ukrainians, for whatever reason, were determined not to lose Avdiivka. They poured hordes of men and tons of equipment into the town of Avdiivka to hold it because they believed that if they held this town and repelled the Russian advance into it, they could justify going before the US, the EU, and the UK asking for more money, saying, look at our success in Avdiivka. We've won, we've held the line. Don't abandon us, send more funds, you know, send lawyers, guns, and money, and uh, we'll, we'll win this thing. Uh, they lost Avdiivka. They had to retreat. And it was a devastating loss, a huge territorial loss in spirit. Not a territorial loss like in scope or size, but losing that town, what they had to sacrifice to try and hold it uh, was, was devastating. And then... A couple weeks later, after Avdiivka fell, on the 5th of March, you know, seven days ago, the architect of the Maidan coup, 
and uh, the, the huge force in the U.S. government that was pushing for, you, for NATO to bring Ukraine in the alliance, Victoria Cookies Newland announcing she's retiring and uh, she's no longer going to serve in the State Department. And that's just a very convenient uh, sequence of events, isn't it? But let's go back to Avdiivka. I'm going to read a story about that battle and uh, how tragic a loss it was for Ukraine and how uh, it definitely portends um, bad news uh, in the future for Ukraine the longer they try to wage this war. And this is from the BBC. February 17th, 24, Avdiivka, Ukraine troops leave embattled eastern town. This is by Yaroslav Lukiv. Ukraine says its troops have withdrawn from Avdiivka, a key eastern town besieged by Russian forces for months. The decision was taken in order to save the soldiers' lives, said President Volodymyr Zelensky. Russia's defense ministry said on Saturday that it had taken full control of the town, with President Vladimir Putin hailing it as an important victory. Its fall marks Russia's biggest win for months, and Mr. Zelensky blamed faltering Western weapon supplies. Almost all of Avdivka's pre-war population of more than 30,000 people have left, and the city itself is almost completely destroyed. Ukraine has been experiencing shortages of ammunition, mainly as a result of political squabbling in the U.S., its main supplier. U.S. President Joe Biden blamed Ukraine's withdrawal from Avdivka on congressional inaction over a crucial foreign aid package, including funding for Ukraine, which forced troops to ration ammo. In a call with Mr. Zelensky, Mr. Biden reiterated that America's unwavering support for Ukraine. Speaking at the Munich Security Conference on Saturday, Zelensky urged Western countries to help Ukraine defeat the monster, as he called Mr. Putin. The Russian leader will make the next few years catastrophic for many more countries like Ukraine if the Western world does not stand up to him, he warned. Mr. Putin launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine on the 24th of February, 2022. Do not ask Ukraine when the war will end. Ask yourself, why is Putin still able to continue it, Mr. Zelensky told the conference. Adiska, Avdivka has been engulfed in fierce fighting for months and has been in battlefield since 2014, when Russian-backed fighters seized large swaths of the eastern Donetsk and Luhansk regions. The fall of Avdivka marks the biggest change on the more than 1,000-kilometer front line since Russian troops seized the nearby town of Bakhmut in May of 23. Announcing the decision to withdraw early on Saturday, the head of the armed forces, General Alexander Sierski, said he acted to avoid encirclement and preserve the lives and health of service personnel. Our soldiers performed their military duty with dignity, but did everything possible to destroy the best Russian military units. Inflicted significant losses on the enemy in terms of manpower and equipment, he said. General Sierski who was only appointed as the country's top commander a few days ago, said Ukrainian troops were taking measures to stabilize the situation and maintain our positions. In a separate statement soon afterwards, one of the deputies said the troops had left Avdiivka to pre-prepared positions. In a situation where the enemy is advancing on the corpses of their own soldiers with a 10-to-1 shell advantage under constant bombardment, this is the only correct solution, General Alexander Tanavirsky added. U.S. National Security Spokesman John Kirby had earlier warned that Ukrainian forces were running out of artillery ammunition, with Russia sending wave after wave of conscript forces to attack Ukrainian positions. And because Congress has yet to pass a supplemental bill, we have not been able to provide Ukraine with artillery shells they desperately need to disrupt these Russian assaults. Earlier this week, the U.S. Senate approved a $95 billion foreign aid package, including $60 billion for Ukraine after months of political wrangling but it faces an uphill battle in the House of Representatives. Ukraine is critically dependent on weapons supplies from the U.S. and other Western allies to keep fighting Ukraine, a much bigger military force with an abundance of artillery ammunition. NATO Secretary Jens Stoltenberg warned on Tuesday that the U.S. failure to approve continued military assistance to Ukraine was already having an impact on the battlefield. Yeah, no kidding. Um, we're funding this war. Ukraine cannot sustain this war without U.S. money, without U.S. weapons. This is clear. Even with the EU sending $93 billion, okay, that $60 billion that's referenced in there, I'm sorry, $95 billion, uh, foreign aid package, right? Well, 60 is for Ukraine. Like the other, you know, $35 billion is probably for Israel and whoever. But $60 billion in addition to the 74 is what they want to send Ukraine uh, in the new package. Uh, 
And General Kirby's like, well, you know why they lost Avdivka, right? It's because uh, you uh, jerk offs in Congress uh, don't want to send them more money and weapons. It's like, yeah, we don't. We don't. Because um, all it's doing is angering Russia, uh, making people look at Russia as the, the good guy here as it tries to fight, you know, the United States via proxy for its, you know, its own territory against its neighbor. And um, it's just costing the U.S. taxpayer more money that uh, appears to be um, fake. Like, it, like I, I don't know who looks at these figures and doesn't sit back for a second and say, is, is money even real? Right. You're told, like, go go to go to school, get a job, pay your taxes and uh, everything else will be gravy. Like, just do those things. Right. Go to school, get education, get a good job as best you can um, work hard and pay your taxes. But look at this money being spent. Like, does, does your money even really exist or is it, is it just, you know, digits on a, a calculator and uh, figures on a piece of paper that can be added or subtracted to? Um, whenever um, Congress or, or the president feels like it. Um, and this, this notion that, well, you know, the reason the Russians won is because they're just sending, you know, bonsai charges of the, these slave soldiers, these conscripts. Um, that tired narrative, like, has to go away. Um, these are professional Russian soldiers who are now moving into these cities to take these key positions. The conscripts, yeah, maybe they were there in the initial wave in 2022 and early 2023. And once Russia broke through the lines and into Ukrainian territory, they sent their professional military behind them because they need professional soldiers to take these key towns like Bakhmut and Avdivka. And Bakhmut was also a major loss for Ukraine. And now with Avdivka in 2024, following Bakhmut in 2023, the writing, like I said, is becoming clear and clear on the wall. The United States and the EU and everybody else cannot keep pace with the Russian war machine. Russia is, is not going to lose this war. They cannot afford to lose this war. It would be existentially destructive for them. They would cease to exist if they were to lose this war. They know that. So they will, they will turn like shoe boxes into artillery shells if they have to but they don't need to they are cranking out artillery and mortars and and cannon shells and bullets by the the hundreds of thousands every week the u.s cannot keep up with it and can't ship it to the ukrainians fast enough for them to be combat effective we are throwing good money after bad and we are sending Ukrainian men to their deaths because of it. And Victoria Nuland was the driving force behind this insane policy uh, that the United States began uh, back in 2014 and more importantly in February of 2022. Let's read about Victoria Nuland, the architect of the Maidan coup and uh, why her retirement may have just uh, sprung up out of nowhere. And this is from Zero Hedge, March 9th, 24. Quote, we got to rein her in, behind the scenes of Newland's early retirement. Former CIA analyst Ray McGovern in a new interview has speculated over the reasons behind Victoria Newland stepping down from her high-ranking position as Undersecretary of the State for Political Affairs, the number three top official in the State Department. Her retirement was announced by her boss, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, on Tuesday, but the question is, why now, when the administration is attempting to stay the course and present a strong, continued stance on Ukraine? Also, as Biden is still seeking to get tens of billions of defense aid through the Republicans in the House. Well, there have been rumors that maybe she could be in poor declining health. McGovern has told Russia's Sputnik that the notoriously hawkish Newland was a liability at a moment NATO and Russia are inching closer to direct nuclear armed confrontation. My best guess here is that the CIA and Defense Department and the NSA got this message around saying, look, Victoria's got her own agenda here, said McGovern. The former CIA official continued to speculate, the president doesn't really want to strike these ammo depots in Russia or knock down the Crimean Bridge, so we got to rein her in. I guess it's time for her to go to early retirement. Another theory, though not necessarily contradictory to the above, 
has been advanced by Professor of National Security at Bowie State University, Dr. Matthew Croston. He laid out what a staunch anti-Putinist Noon was and how fervently she wanted to continue to utilize Ukraine as a platform in which to continue to weaken and or slight Russia on the global stage, and perhaps even to up the ante in the conflict with her support of sending ballistic missiles into Ukraine. But she also knows the Ukrainian side is losing. She may have seen the writing on the wall as Ukraine forces are in retreat and wanted to bail before the potential defeat, total defeat. Quote, she undoubtedly understood that if American support lessens or wanes, Ukraine losses, loses, period, Crossan pointed out. Perhaps she did not want to be in the administration that would be responsible for that outcome. But both McGovern and Crossan would agree that with Nguyen as Undersecretary for Political Affairs, in this capacity she basically ran all of U.S. foreign policy in Europe, ceasefire talks between Kiev and Moscow remained an extremely distant prospect or even a possibility. One thing is certain, as long as Newland remained in that chair, there was literally no chance such talk could be even theorized. Now it can, Crossan concluded. Newland's temporary replacement for undersecretary upon her retirement has been announced as career diplomat John Bass, a former ambassador to Afghanistan. He is currently in the position of undersecretary of state for management. He oversaw Biden's botched withdrawal from Afghanistan and so it's somewhat ironic that he's also oversee Ukraine's policy at this critical juncture where Kiev is clearly against the ropes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, John Bass, yeah, the, he was, was secretary uh, or former ambassador to Afghanistan during uh, our um, catastrophic withdrawal from that country. I'll tell you what, if, if the Ukrainian bros aren't nervous uh, now, uh, wait till Mr. Bass takes over. He's kind of like the undertaker, I, uh, I'm, I'm thinking here. It's like, listen, Victoria Newland has royally screwed this up for her own personal reasons. Like, again, her, her real name is not Newland. Her last name uh, goes back to a certain tribe of folks, um, Noodleman. Uh, her, her great-grandfather or father, I believe, uh, uh, were um, persecuted, uh, maybe during uh, a certain period in Russia's history where there were pogroms. And um, she is now trying to exact some blood revenge on Vladimir Putin and the Russian people and is was using uh, Ukraine as a foil to try and accomplish that and look at the horror and the havoc that she has wrought uh, on both those countries and the United States as a result. Victoria Noodleman. Yeah, look up that family history, by the way. Interesting stuff. Actually, Gonzalo Lira did a uh, fantastic uh, hour and a half um, live stream all about Victoria Noodleman's family history and uh, her husband, Paul Kagan, and why folks of uh, her background might be interested in seeing Russia suffer and fall. And it's completely backfired. And these people should not be near any levers of power in the U.S. government um, at all because of it. But John Bass is taking over, as I said, the, um, the former ambassador in Afghanistan, the undertaker. Uh, he's coming in to, um, well, maybe embalm the body and get it ready for, uh, for burial. Uh, that is not a good sign for Ukraine. Uh, it's like, well, you know, Victoria, she's got her own agenda Folks, the CIA, the NSA, all the other alphabet agencies that make these decisions have just not an agreement like it's time for her to go. And we'll bring in our boy John and we'll, uh, we'll let him know that uh, it's probably time to call this a wrap soon. And, um, well, let's just uh, let's see how things are going on the ground in Ukraine uh, now that Victoria has found her way to the exits. And uh, if there's any... Uh, substance to the idea that John Bass is being brought in as the undertaker. This article is from Newsweek. This is five days ago. Title, Russia destroys three Abrams tanks, three HIMARS, and eight Bradleys in 10 days, Moscow. Story by Ellie Cook. Russia has destroyed three donated Abrams tanks in southern Ukraine since late February, according to Moscow, as Russia claims to have destroyed a slew of advanced U.S. supplied equipment on the front lines. On Wednesday, Russia said its forces had destroyed a U.S.-made Abrams tank operated by Ukraine close to the captured eastern city of Avdivka, which Moscow has controlled since mid-February. 
Moscow claimed it knocked out a first Abrams tank in late February and said on Monday it had taken out a second one during clashes around villages west of Avdivka. The U.S. has sent 31 Abrams tanks to Ukraine, which arrived in the war-torn country in the fall of 23. Analysts say the handful of tanks are a boost to Ukraine stocks, but they came in too small a quantity to make a real difference to Kyiv's war effort. Alongside the Abrams, the U.S. has delivered nearly 200 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles to Ukraine. Fighters deployed around Avdivka earlier this week told Newsweek that Russia armored vehicle crews were afraid to launch operations when they knew that a Bradley would be against them. But Russia said that since the end of February, it had taken out eight Bradleys. On Tuesday, the Russian Defense Ministry said it destroyed a Ukrainian Bradley fighting vehicle on the eastern front lines around Avdivka. The previous day, Moscow said Ukraine lost three Bradleys west of the city and another in the battles early on, the, on during the weekend. On February 28th, Russia said Kyiv's fighters had lost two Bradley infantry fighting vehicles in eastern Ukraine. Ukrainian troops lost another Bradley around Avdivka the previous day, Moscow said. Russia also said it had destroyed three U.S.-made high-mobility artillery rocket systems, or HIMARS, in the east and south of the country. Analysts say figures from Russia on Ukraine's report losses are generally inflated, and Ukraine rarely comments on its own losses. Footage widely circulated online earlier appears to confirm the loss of one Ukrainian HIMARS. Russia has repeatedly claimed to have destroyed HIMARS since the system arrived in Ukraine in the summer of 2022. This is the first visual evidence of the loss of one of the artillery systems. Videos shared by open source intelligence accounts in recent days also appear to show an Abrams tank in flames. Newsweek reached out to the Ukrainian military for comment via email. Last month, footage appeared to show two damaged HIMARS vehicles arriving in the United States from Ukraine for repairs. The U.S. has donated a total of 39 HIMARS to Ukraine, and Kyiv has lauded their effectiveness against Russian forces. Yeah. Well, um... They seem to be very effective uh, until they're blown up and need to be sent back to the United States for repairs. Or they're just blown up and completely destroyed. But um, yeah, uh, if you remember uh, less than a year ago, uh, Russia had uh, video uh, confirmation uh, evidence of destroying a Challenger tank, which is the UK's version of the Abrams. It's basically the Abrams tank with, you know, some UK... Uh, sticker slapped on it, some modifications. I think there's like a tea maker, like in the cockpit. But it's uh, an Abrams tank. Uh, the Russians have destroyed a Challenger, at least one Challenger, and now three Abrams tanks. And the Abrams tank is still, I think, the best tank in U.S. inventory. It's still our workhorse. Um, but it's almost 40 years old now. I want to say the Abrams tank first saw major deployment in the um, Persian Gulf War in like the early 90s, like 91, 90, 1990. Um, it's getting long in the tooth. Now, I'm sure it's been retrofitted and upgraded with all the infrared technology and um, uh, modern um, armor and weaponry, but it's like putting a new chassis on a 1990 Ford F-150. It's, it's still a Ford F-150. Russia is not the Russia of 1990. They have uh, drones, they have uh, hypersonic missiles, they have upgraded tanks that now can destroy the best of what America is putting out there. This should scare the hell out of the U.S. Uh, military industrial complex. Uh, they can't make armor now uh, that is impervious to Russian weapons. And you can't just throw a 22-year-old Ukrainian kid into a U.S. Abrams tank and show him, okay, this lever goes forward, this lever goes side to side, this wheel turns the turret, uh, that's your clutch, that's your other clutch, uh, that's your brake, and your gas pedal is behind your right elbow. Um, we're going to teach you how to drive this uh, in the next two weeks. It doesn't happen that way. Like, to get training on armor, especially something as sophisticated as the Abrams tank, you're going to need at least a year. And they threw these Ukrainian soldiers who probably had never driven a Ford F-150 in their lives into a multi-million dollar Abrams tank and said, good luck, I hope you don't get blown up. And three have been blown up. And three HIMARS and at least eight Bradleys. So things aren't going well uh, on the battlefield in Ukraine. We are sending these guys 
equipment and they're just driving it around long enough to get um, to get nuked, to get blown up. Um, it's it's slowing Russia down, but not not impeding them, right? And Russia is in no particular hurry to win this war. They would rather the U.S. keep sending, as I said, good money after bad. They would rather win this war by attrition because, like I said, they can raise a million-man army if they need to. And if the Ukrainian lines break because there are simply no more men to replace the people on the front line, the Russian troops will walk through Ukraine unopposed because the war of attrition will have reached its conclusion and that is Ukraine is out of money, but more importantly, they're out of manpower. We don't have bodies to put into these Bradleys, to put into these Abrams tanks. We don't have guys to you know, give rifles to even be infantry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that bad now. And um, Victoria Newland is doing what all US government officials do when uh, their plans don't work out, they uh, give a tip of the cap and they make their way uh, stage left exit. And they take a job on K Street in Washington, D.C., working for some think tank or writing articles in uh, you know, the Washington Times or the New York uh, Times or the Washington Post or whatever. And they talk about um, you know their experiences and what they would do and 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 like try to uh, pass themselves off as consultants and advisors, even though during their actual government careers they were unmitigated catastrophes, and somehow this does they, they do it without shame. But yeah, Cookies Newland uh, is leaving the scene. Uh, John Bass is coming in, the uh, former ambassador of Afghanistan. And um, we are now over two years into the Ukrainian war with, uh, with Russia. Ukraine will never be allowed to join NATO. Russia will send a million men and use nuclear weapons to keep that from happening. We, they've said as much. Um, this is a giant money laundering operation. I've said that from the start. And they are using Ukrainian men and boys as the pawns on that chessboard for their money laundering game. And it is sick. Uh, it makes me sick to think about it that we are going to sacrifice a generation of Ukrainian men or more and their beautiful country so that people in our government and people in the military industrial complex can uh, line their pockets a little bit more. And uh, we have an election coming up in a couple months. And if it goes the way a lot of people are hoping it will go, this war will end and possibly uh, the bloodshed will end with it. Uh, it's not going to be um, pleasant for Ukraine either way, but this war cannot be won. They will not win a guerrilla war either because Russia simply cannot let Ukraine have its autonomy if its autonomy is in any way hostile to Russia. They must either be neutral or friendly to Russia. And if they give up that neutrality, Russia will not give up this war. And they will go on as long as they have to, and they may repatriate the entire country of Ukraine to the Russian Federation as Russia if they have to. And then they might move on to Sweden and Finland. But that'll be an episode for a different time. Uh, yeah. Victoria Newland gone. Gonzalo Lira proven right from behind the grave. Um, I wish he was here to see this, but uh, unfortunately he's not. So I'm sharing it uh, with you all. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, give us a thumbs up. A subscribe if you haven't. And we will see you back here next time. I'm going to begin the uh, Hoplite series on how we save America or how we could possibly save America if there's still a chance for it to be saved. So I hope you come uh, back and tune in for that. Till then, take it easy.
Americans have to figure out a way to maintain this alliance because this alliance, when I talk about the NATO alliance, it's not an alliance. It's a vassalage. It's the system to maintain the Western European nations as vassal states to the global American empire. And so if the NATO pact, if the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization starts to collapse internally, i.e. if different countries start waking up and saying to themselves, you know, the Germans, the French, the Brits, the Italians, the Portuguese, whomever, if they start waking up and saying, hey, how come we're in this alliance? This is proving no benefit to us and a whole lot of detriments to us. Why are we in it? Especially now, considering that the Russians view every NATO country as an enemy state and isn't going to be trading with us and isn't going to be helping us in different areas, food, energy resources, and, what the, rest of, and the rest of it. Why are we still in NATO? And so the Americans cannot allow that questioning of NATO. They have to maintain this alliance, which, as I said, is really a vassalage system. They have to maintain it. And so what better way to maintain it than to create a new enemy? I mean, think of it. NATO came to be because it was an alliance to protect Western Europe from the encroachment of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is no more, but following Putin's 2007 speech, at least, NATO pivoted to have Russia as the enemy. That was the whole point, starting in at least 2007, one could argue since the late 90s, it doesn't really matter, that's really academic, but at this time it's very obvious that NATO is just an alliance aimed towards Russia, the common enemy, right? But the Russians have no imperial ambitions. They have no ambitions to take over Poland or Romania or Moldova or any other country, much less the Baltic states. They care about Russian people. The ethnic Russian people. That's why they're in Ukraine, because they wanted to end the killing, the, the ethnic genocide that was going to be happening to ethnic Russians in the Donbass region. Mm -hmm. So once this conflict is over, you know, there might be little, little skirmishes or little crises in the Baltics and Poland and Romania, you know, sort of like trying to create some sort of, you know, furtherance of this conflict between uh, NATO and Russia, but it's probably not going to work because the, the Russians have no interest in those countries. They just care about their own people. Right? And, and they have bigger fish to fry. They're prepared for a war with NATO, no question. Do they have imperial ambitions for NATO territory? No. It's very obvious. They, they don't care. They care about their own people. They've got bigger fish to fry than to go out there and go to Poland or someplace else. And so there might be, at the end of this conflict in Ukraine, some little skirmishes, but they're not going to be, they're probably, I hope, they're not going to be flashpoints into some sort of real, you know, Ukraine 2 conflict, you know, say over Poland or the Baltics. Let's hope that that doesn't happen. But let's assume for the sake of argument that it doesn't happen. The United States, as a priority, will want to maintain this alliance because, as I said, it's a vassalage of Western Europe. And so how do you maintain a group of people together? who have very different priorities and very different objectives. You create a common enemy. That's how NATO was held together after the end of the Cold War. Look, the Russians are the enemy. But now that Russia will have succeeded and Russia will be too big and strong to really have a second round, well, they're going to have to pivot in a different direction. And that's going to be China.